It's my pleasure today to be joined by Senator Tammy Nichols, who is uh, the incumbent over in District 10. So without any further ado, um, Tammy, thanks for joining me. And you know, what brought you to the point where you're serving in the legislature? And um, <laughs> what's uh, you know, what are what are your future plans? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Brian. I appreciate it. You know, what brought me to this point? Uh, that is a great question. And it's one that I've been asked a lot of times. And and uh, I usually start out telling people that this was not my plan. Uh, this really wasn't. Um, I was content being a mom and raising my kids. I have five children. And so, you know, just doing the whole mom thing. I was involved in their schools and uh, helping with different um things within the schools. And, uh, and then my youngest son was a second grader and he brought home a paper that said common core on it. And he was supposed to do all, there's multiple um, little problems to solve on it. And they were, you could tell they were basically math problems, uh, a few word problems, but, um, I was going through it and I couldn't figure out what he was supposed to do on it. And he didn't know what he was supposed to do. His dad didn't know what he was supposed to do. And I saw where it said Common Core on it. And I thought, well, this is a different, I've never heard of this before. What is this? So, you know, I took the steps that parents usually take, you know, go talk to the teacher. And she really didn't have a great answer that he would just be a more critical thinker. And this would just be so much better for him to learn, uh, for all the kids to learn. And uh, talk to the principal, talk to the superintendent, talk to the curriculum director. Uh, reached out to my representatives and didn't ever hear anything back from them. Uh, there was several other parents that were also concerned what was going on in my district. And so we got together and uh, started um, reaching out to other legislators that would talk to us. And then uh, we started going down to the Capitol and just as citizens um, being engaged and taking the information that we'd found in regards to what Common Core was and, and what it was doing and started testifying at the legislature and then helping on reading and writing bills. Uh, I started working with other organizations, um, started working with some national organizations, and uh, that just kind of opened up several opportunities for me. Uh, but I decided that there were two things that I had learned going through all that process. And one was that there was a disconnect between the people and the government, and that two, that my district really needed some better representation that would listen to the people and at least be respondent to them. So I decided to run run for office and um, I'd already been involved uh, with the Republican party um, as a precinct committeeman. And, uh, and so I started taking those steps um, on, on running for office and um, started in the house or four years over in the house and then just finished my second year over in the Senate side. Uh, Cause I made that jump last time from, from house over to Senate uh, because there was some issues in the Senate that needed to to be worked out, I felt, and so thought that I could, you know, put my put my expertise over there and try to help facilitate that. What are uh, what are some of the differences between the House and the Senate? You're one of the few who've served in both now. Uh, yeah. it's, I mean, not to go off on a tangent, but it's a little weird to me that we have we we still have two different houses because you're you're both elected by the same people on the same schedule. Uh, you mm -hmm. represent the same districts, but there are significant. Yeah cultural differences and, you know, legislative differences yeah. between the two. Yeah, there, there are some differences. And, you know, I mean, one thing that's unique with Idaho is a lot of other states, their Senate and House, they serve different terms. So a lot of other states, the House will serve two years, the Senate will be in for four. We do everything on the same. So everybody is a two-year term. Um, you know, there's not like a ton of differences. I would say probably the ones that are the most um, substantial are that, of course, the Senate is a smaller body because there's only 35 members in there versus the 70 in the in the um, House. And so your committees are smaller um, and we don't have as many committees on the Senate side as they do on the House side. Uh, you do get to know people a little bit more um, intimately just because there's not so many people to to have to get that you're working with and that um, that you get to know. So that helps a little bit, I think, especially when you're trying to um, promote your legislation or talk to people about legislation. There's some decor differences um, in the House. They have a speaker in the Senate. The lieutenant governor is the president that um, that runs the floor. Um, when we have people that we introduce in the gallery on the House side, they wave. On the Senate side, they clap. 
Um, on the Senate side, we're the ones that do the governor's um, appointments. And so we handle that portion of it. The House side is where pretty much everything revenue tax related starts. Um, let's see, what other ones can I think of? Um, yeah, I think main, mainly it's just that it's a smaller body. And so it is easier to get to know people. Um, on the House side, they're they're known as to be a little bit more on the rowdy side, if you will. And then on the Senate, we're a little bit more the prestigious side, I guess, if you will. Um, and uh, but and there's just some differences in how you debate, uh, not a lot, but just a few things. Just as uh, you know, how you respond, what you say. Um, you know, on the Senate, we're always supposed to say, um, you know, good senators or something along those lines. We're on the House side. You can say, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, stuff like that. They get to eat on the House side. They get to they suspend their rule over there so that they can eat and drink on the Senate. The only thing we can get away with is um, basically some drinks and they have to be <laughs> under, I think, eight, six or eight ounces, something like that. So anyway, those are just some little little insights on the differences. <laughs> that's that's funny how those different rules and traditions just develop and you know, I'm, I'm I'm sure there is some of them that nobody is really sure where they came from, but that's just the way things are done. A lot of things are considered tradition. <laughs> so shifting gears a bit, you represent District 10 after you had redistricting in, uh, you know, after the 2020 census. And I'm looking at it on right. my map here. It's, uh, you know, a lot of small towns. Uh, is Middleton or Star maybe the biggest community there? Uh, yeah, Middleton, lot, Star. A lot, lot, lot of farmland, a lot of rural areas. Yeah. Yeah. What's, uh, you know, what's it like? What are some of the unique challenges that the residents of District 10 face? And what are the priorities you've learned as you've you know, talked to your constituents? Yeah. Um, you know, we do have a lot of farm, a lot of ag that's out here. And um, but that that's not new to when I was in District 11 before we, we redistrict, I took in a lot of things, um, Middleton and then towards Oregon. So a lot of those small towns like Parman, Notice, Wilder, and now we're uh, District 10 and we have Middleton, Star, North Nampa, and then some of the little outskirt areas, but not, not many. Um, and so there's, you know, my districts remain relatively close to the same as what it was before as far as needs and things like that. Of course, growth has been a huge, huge um, thing that has taken place because my district, um, like a lot of other districts, has grown a lot. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, taxes are still a lot of things that are on people's minds about being able to eliminate taxes. Um, you know, inflation is at a crazy all time high. We're spending almost a billion dollars every 80 to 85 days on the federal level. Uh, and so, you know, everybody's feeling that in their wallet. And, uh, you know, what can we do here in the state, uh, in our, in our, local areas to be able to help offset that and that's to cut cut taxes as much as we can or to eliminate them um you know now some of the taxes like property tax the state does not collect property tax uh that's done all local and so you also have the local municipality the local level government that can also do things um so that's not all on the state level but can't, some can be done at the local level um, you know, some of the challenges is that we've had a lot of new people that have moved into our state in general, and my area is no exception. I've had a lot of new people that have come here from other states like California and Colorado and um, Washington and Oregon, Nevada, that have moved here because they're truly political refugees. Um, they're trying to get out of this, these states that um, just became horrendous to, to try to live in, to try to function in. And they came here to Idaho hoping that Idaho was this beacon of uh, red and conservatism and everything like that. And while we are in many ways, we have a blue management that's taking, that has taken place here in the state. And so the challenge really is to try to educate people on, you know, what Idaho is, what it's going through and what's happening here, especially during these elections. Um, and because they come from a state where you have maybe just a handful of Republicans, so to speak, that are actual Republicans. And then you get over here and everybody is, is almost legitimately running as a Republican or, or they, they say they are. Um, but not everybody here with an R by their name is actually a Republican. And so I've been telling people that, you know, an R by your name uh, doesn't necessarily mean Republic anymore. It means research and you got to research. 
uh, you got to look into these people that are running because these are the ones that are making the decisions so that this state doesn't, it, it has two ways it can go. We can either go down the same path that California and Washington and a lot of these other states around us have gone, or we can go down this other path where we really try to sustain our state and our sovereignty and protect it from, from all the horrible outside influences that are going on um, and, uh, and, and keep it as red as we possibly can um, for those that live here. So that's been a little bit of a challenge just to try to educate people on what elections are like here um, and, you know, how people are running and that, you know, we want, I, I appreciate the people that have moved here though, because they have seen what has transpired. They know those warning signs, those red flags, like take ranked choice voting, for instance, right? There's several states that they implemented ranked choice voting. They're trying to do that in our state now. And the people that I've talked to that have come from states where they implemented ranked choice voting, they're saying, no, you do not want to do this. This is the way that they were able to really flip the state is by going into these open primaries and, and ranked choice voting. So stay away from that. So I talk to, to these people that have come in a lot just because they have that wherewithal of what they saw happen in their state. And they know those warning signs for us in our state here. There, there at the end, you, you talked about the, you know, you know, the gem state heist, you know, taking Idaho in the same direction as Colorado, California, Washington, Oregon. Uh, right. And not, not to put words in anyone's mouth, but I, I think the, you know, the more establishment folks, what they would say is that it's actually right wing extremism that is driving people away from the Republican Party. And that's what's going to turn Idaho blue. So it. Is is that the case, or uh, are we just too extreme? Are, uh, are are we scaring people away from the Republican brand? <laughs> you know what I think is happening is what the people that they're labeling as the extremists now, which I've been labeled multiple times as an extremist, uh, but I can never get anyone to really clearly define what that means. Uh, does it mean that you scored a certain way on somebody's whatever? That's that's some some definition that I've heard. That's really the best one I've actually heard, which isn't very good. But it seems like the ones that they're labeling the extremists are the ones that are adhering to the Constitution. They want to function under uh, dual federalism, which means that government stays within within its boundaries and its jurisdictions. Uh, and that always favors the people uh, that they're, they're the ones that, um, you know, are trying to support traditional families, protect children, protect our gun rights. Uh, that's what seems to be extreme now. Um, you know, adhere to, to Christian values and principles. That's the extreme. now. Uh, and so I really think personally, I mean, there was a saying several years ago, um, you saw a movement of Democrats that were moving away from the Democrat party because it became too, too crazy for them. And they would say, you know, I didn't leave the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party left me. And I think that's what we're ha having happen here in Idaho right now is that we have people, um, you know, like myself, that I'm a Republican. I, I have not, I adhere to the Republican Party platform. I adhere to the principles. I have not changed. But I think you have some that they're, they're trying to utilize that as a reason to leave because they're the ones that are changing. They're the ones that want to allow more government intrusion. They want us to take the federal dollars. They want us to continue to go further and further in debt. I mean, you have some that, like I said, that are some Republicans uh, that, and some are well-known like past governors that are now supporting Democrats, um, that are supporting the ranked choice voting, that um, you know are okay with some of our second amendment rights to be uh, infringed upon, um, that that these are the things that they have started moving towards. So I think it's kind of the opposite here than in some other states where the traditional Republican, conservative Republican that I know, like myself, have stayed exactly where, I mean, I haven't changed in the in the six years that I've been in the legislature and before, I've, I, I've come closer and closer to adhering to the Republican party, to being constitutional. So I haven't changed. Um, but we see these others that are stepping more towards the moderate to uniparty to more of a leftist Republican, um, you know, and so it's it's interesting to watch those dynamics happen. Well, I, I visualize our society as a, you know, it's it's a river that's moving always leftwards. Uh, all, other people use the a ratchet and gear as a, as the analogy, but the same thing. We're moving to the left 
And yeah. just standing still is hard enough, much less, you know, going back to any form of conservatism. So if you're floating down the river leftward and you see someone standing still, you think, oh, they're they're going they're moving further to the right. Yeah, moving a little direction right. Well, and you know, kind of going back to the people that have moved into our state, you know, there's blame that some of these people want to place on the people that have come into our state. And they're like, they're the ones that are changing it. They're the ones that are doing this. Well, no, it's not. We have a lot of multi-generational Idahoans that have either been complacent or have allowed and helped to make some of these cha these negative changes come into our state. And so, again, I go back to the majority, and I think there was a poll or something that was put out not too long ago showing that the majority of people moving into Idaho are very Republican, they're very conservative, and they're very Christian. And so that's not, but that's who they want to blame when they're the ones that are actually doing the changes. They're the ones that are trying to implement the changes, like illegal dri or driver's licenses for illegals, right? That was something that's been pushed in our, in our state a few times. And it hasn't been pushed in by the new people that are coming in. Those are the people that are trying to stop it. It was brought in by people that have lived in Idaho for a long time and supported by, uh, you know, people that have been in Idaho for a long time. So, so yeah, so it's, it's really interesting, but that's, that's the dynamic that I see. So kind of along those same lines, uh, a few weeks ago at a candidate forum, I heard another legislator, uh, Republican say that, you know, he didn't like the idea of caucuses, uh, the Freedom Caucus or the Main Street Caucus. You know, we should all just be Republicans. And as nice as that sounds, obviously there are significant differences of opinion and worldview from within the Republican Party. And so I think it's only natural for people to coalesce with like-minded people. Um, obviously, you're co-chair of the Idaho Freedom Caucus. Well, where do you see the value in having a you know a caucus within a caucus like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's a great question. And, you know, in Idaho, we actually have several types of caucuses. There's also like a sportsman's caucus. And so you have different caucuses um, because you have people that are like minded that kind of come together uh, and group together. For me, for the Idaho Freedom Caucus, you know, that has given us a network to be able to expand our message on and to be able to work more intimately with um other Freedom Caucus members that are in other states. So a lot of people are familiar with the Freedom Caucus in general. That's a congressional level. Uh, you know, people uh, that were in office like Raul Labrador at that time, they helped start it, Jim Jordan. Um, uh, you know, you have several people that helped facilitate the Freedom Caucus. And then the idea was, well, why don't we put those into our states? Because, you know, we can network, we can share messages. A lot of things that happen in Idaho are happening in other states. And so it gives us a broader platform. It gives us um, more networking capability and it helps us to be able to um, spread information out because I travel to a lot of other places across the United States and I'll start talking to other legislators and I find out that, yep, the same thing that's happening there is happening in Idaho. And the same thing that's happening in Idaho is happening in other states. Now that doesn't mean that every state is exactly the same. There's differences. But you see a lot of the same major issues transpire within all the, all the states at some point in time. Uh, if it hasn't gotten to your state, it's probably going to get there pretty soon. So, so it just gives us a broader message. It helps us to network together. And then it does help us to facil facilitate on the state level, um, you know, banning together on some of these really major issues um, like the library bill or transgender uh, bathroom or, you know, budget stuff. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways. It really just depends on what the philosophies are of the caucus. And for the Idaho Freedom Caucus, it's definitely, I mean, we have we have our little list that, that, that we give out and it has to do with family, with upholding the constitution, with protecting people's rights. I mean, those are, those are just basic Republican conservative ideologies. And so that's really where we stand and it helps us to, to try to facilitate to be able to push legislation that upholds those values or to try to stop legislation that takes away from those. You mentioned uh, being able to network with, you know, other people in other states to, you know, see what's going on out there, see what's coming on our way. One of the things I really noticed this year, you know, besides, you know, people talking about, uh, you know, being fifth generation Idahoans and the, you know, the carpetbaggers <laughs> coming in from California was mm -hmm. that anything that, you know, 
they disagreed with, they, they said, well, this isn't an Idaho problem, and we need <laughs> Idaho solutions to Idaho problems. Perhaps the most egregious one was the when Senator Lanny brought his anti-slap bill in, yeah. uh, which a bunch of other states have adopted. It seems like a common yeah. sense thing, uh, mm -hmm. but the debate against it was, well, this, is, this isn't an Idaho problem. Uh, <laughs> what, what's going on with that rhetoric, and, and how do we how, how do we move beyond that? Yeah, I think it's a it's a uh, cop out. I think utilizing that because I have heard that on the floor multiple times when I was on the House side and we first brought the library bill, which was House Bill 666. I remember hearing a few times on the floor from legislators that, well, this isn't happening in Idaho. We don't need this. Well, come to find out. Yeah, that has been happening in Idaho. We've had multiple people Go to their go to their libraries, and I'm not saying every library is doing this because you're never going to bat a hundred. So, um, so, but people going to their libraries, legislators going to their local libraries, and finding harmful material in there that was very accessible to to minors. But you hear that multiple times, and I really think that's used as a cop out to be able to vote uh, a certain way on on an issue. Uh, so like the library bill, the, the ones that I heard that said that on the house side were the ones that voted against it. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is a cop out because pretty much any major issue, social or what have you that are happening in whatever state, um, is eventually going to get to Idaho if it's not here already. And my approach, I like to be proactive. I would rather be proactive than reactive on, th on issues because it's so much easier to be able to put things into play before something happens than it is after. It's like, you know, it's great to have a good uh, system set up for in case you have a fire in your house instead of your house catches on fire and then you try to figure out what that system should be on how you take care of it. So, um, so it's just better to be proactive. So yeah, I really think that that um, whole thing about, you know, it's not happening in Idaho or we need Idaho solutions for Idaho problems is really just a cop out. Along those same lines, something a lot of other states have been doing is uh, school choice with money following the student. And that seems to be a tough nut to crack here in Idaho. Uh, obviously, you sponsored a bill wow. a year ago, the education savings yeah. account. Uh, couldn't get through the Senate floor. And then this year, a, a tax credit bill, which seems like the most <laughs> common sense, you know, very, very simple. light touch. Yeah, um, very simple. Didn't even get out of committee. So right. I, I guess my, my question would be, what what do you want to see? And how do we get it through the legislature? Yeah, I really think that is where things come down to. You have to have people in office that have a backbone and are going to support uh, those types of things. We know that school choice is a huge issue here in Idaho. Uh, another survey that was done by Boise State University shows that people want to see universal school choice. And so I think the problem that we have here is we have a lot of adherence to the teachers unions. Um, you know, you, you hear about, places like New York or Chicago, where the teachers unions really have a stronghold on those cities and, and those states. I think we do here in Idaho, too. I think it's much more prevalent than what people realize. And so I think there's a lot of adherence to pleasing the teachers union. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that the teachers union here in Idaho really got behind um, the governor's race last time to help elect um, the governor. And so I think there's a lot of um, adherence to supporting the teachers unions, even if it's kind of a, a roundabout way of doing it. Um, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the teachers unions here. And, uh, and so it's going to take electing people and getting them into office that have a backbone. Uh, we've had states that have passed school choice, universal school choice, that are not even remotely as close to being Republican as or conservative as Idaho is. Uh, and so it is just it's I think Missouri was just recently, like just within the last couple of weeks, passed uh, universal school choice. So and the thing that we know for sure is that states that start implementing school choice, it works really, really well. Um, they will some states will start with a lighter touch, like a tax credit or what have you. But from my research, it's proven that as states move down that that um, path, they ultimately get to universal school choice. And it's usually through an ESA, an education savings account, which is not a voucher. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, so that is what the what the people actually desire. And it does work well when when you implement it correctly. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I, and I continue to support it and I will continue to support uh, school choice options, uh, universal school choice options specifically for Idaho, but it's gonna take getting people in office that are gonna have the backbone to be able to do it. So I recently talked to someone out East who opposed money following the children in school choice, but supported the launch grant. And I, I asked him to you know, square that circle. So I'll, I'll flip it around then. If we okay. want money to follow the children at the K-12 level, then why do we oppose the launch grant? Yeah, well, there's a few reasons. For one, constitutionally, Idaho's only um, beholden to K-12 through education, basically. Um, the launch program is for after that. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you have a lot of people that support the launch program, but they don't support the K through 12 portion, which that's the portion that we actually really need, um, you know, because we see the test scores that are coming out. We see what's happening in our education system. And again, it's not 100%. There are great school districts that are doing some amazing things. They have some great things set up and their students are doing well, but we should be giving all students the option that fits best for them and their families. And so the launch program is for kids after school. Um, you know, it reminds me more of the whole Biden thing, you know, like just give free college education. And um, unfortunately, the things that they've implemented for um, post-secondary education just continue to look like, well, it makes things worse. It's making things worse for college education. Um, degrees, uh, remember when an associate's degree was actually worth something, and now they're not worth anything. I mean, now you have, you know, the things that businesses want to see that they would have taken a, an associate's degree for. Well, now you need a bachelor's degree for it. And so, and when we have kids that are coming out of our education system, our post-secondary, that they are in all this debt. They have all this stuff going on. Not everyone can qualify for the launch program anyway. They're not, it's not universal for all kids to be able to utilize. I've talked to several families where they applied for it and they didn't get it. Um, it doesn't force kids to stay in Idaho after they've gotten their degree. And so, um, but really it kind of boils down to this is tax money. And is this the best way to be, to utilize tax money? Um, and constitutionally, we're not obligated. So I really think it has to do with it's not the proper role of government. That's that's my baseline for it. It's not the proper role of government to fund um, post-secondary education. Speaking of the proper role of government, that's you know that's something I've been asking everybody about. It seems like there's a divide within the Republican Party over what is the role of government. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of folks say it should just be protect life, liberty, and property, just like in 1789. Uh, but then... <laughs> You know, we look back over the last hundred years, government's gotten involved in various things. And there's a lot of Republicans today who will say that there are things the government can and should do. And I think we see some crossover there with mm -hmm. uh, you know, the business associations like IACI and you know, the big healthcare firms, the you know, the dairy lobbies, the yeah. ag lobbies, e even the teachers unions, the people they support are almost entirely separate from the people supported by, say, Citizens Alliance or the, the Idaho Freedom Pack. It's there's very little overlap there. So yeah. it really seems like there's two factions in the Republican Party. And the difference is, what is the role of government? Um, right. How do, again, how, how do we square that circle? How do we, uh, can we get back right. to a constitutional framework of the role of government? Or are we going to just have to accept that there are certain things that the government's involved in and we need to, you know, make it work as best as possible? Right. Well, I totally adhere to limited government. So that's kind of my base principle there. And really, I think what we have going on is it goes back to federalism again. So we're functioning under what's called cooperative federalism right now, when we should be functioning under dual federalism. And again, dual federalism is, I like to think of it about in, in the way of cake. So dual federalism is where you have layered cake. So you cut the cake open, you have all these nice layers that are in there, right? Everything is defined. It has its boundaries. That's how dual federalism federalism functions. It's it's defined, government's defined, it has its boundaries, its jurisdictions. Um, it benefits the people and it creates a, uh, a environment that's not chaotic. Um, we are functioning under cooperative federalism. It's like a marble cake. So you cut the cake open, everything's blended and twisted and you have all these things, nothing's defined, nothing has its boundaries. Well, that's what we're currently functioning in and government is functioning the same way. We have blurred boundaries. We have limited jurisdiction that's transpiring 
And that favors the lobbyists and the corporations and it creates chaos within the system. So those are the two things that we have you know, going on right now. And we are functioning under one when we should be functioning under the other one. And so you have uh, organizations like IACI uh, that benefit from that because government is favoring the corporations, it's favoring the lobbyists, it's not favoring the people. And the people are just the pawns in the whole, <laughs> in the whole thing. They just need our money. They just need our taxes. That's what they need. Um, you know, we have a lot of businesses. You take healthcare. Uh, we have very little just true family practice um, uh, offices anymore. Everything's bought has been bought up by these large hospitals, and so they're they're running all these things um, in healthcare. And so there's there's little like mom and pop type um, uh, health businesses anymore for hospitals. Um, you have the, the agriculture industry. A lot of our farms um, are being bought up by large corporate um, ag industry um, businesses. And I'm not saying that there's anything like horrible, awful about it, but it does weigh in on how we're functioning as a state and where our interest lies. And so you see a lot of programs, a lot of things that are put into place in law that benefit the, the corporations, that benefit the large entities. And, and it's done on the backs of the, of the taxpayer, of the small businesses, of the, um, you know, just living paycheck to paycheck, blue collar type workers. Um, and so that's really where I think there's a problem within our system is that we're functioning under the wrong kind of federalism and it does not benefit you and I or taxpayers in general. Well, in that same arena, um you know, the big businesses and uh, PACs and lobby groups and, you know, even the governor's mm -hmm. PAC have been spending a lot of money attacking you and other right. members of the Freedom Caucus for, for months and months now. Uh, yep. You know, for, 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 first and, of all, and how... that's why you have that happening is because they want to get people in there that are going to do their bidding, that will make those changes in law that will benefit them, not benefit the people, but benefit the corporations, benefit the big industries. And so they need people that are going to be in there that are going to be their rubber stampers, that are going to be their water carriers, if you will, that will continue to help benefit them. I know in my races, um, currently and in my past races, you know, they have they have put people against me to run that will help facilitate that sort of stuff. And so, you know, that that's very concerning. And it's not just in my race, it's in other races too, but they and I say they collectively with you, you have the PACs, you have the different corporations, the lobbyists. I mean, you have industries um, like power industry or, you know, we, we, we're we kind of in a monopoly with a lot of our utilities. And so one is with power and some of the money that, you know, we pay, I mean, I pay my power bill, I give money to the power company. Well, they take that money and they use it against me. <laughs> or you'll have, you know, some of these other industries where you have to pay because you have to have this service. And then they take that money because they have a PAC and, or they use IACI and they take that money and, and utilize it to run against people. Um, and so it's, it's, it's funny, it's funneling money into the system that you want to see. It's very similar to like, say, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood creates its, um, its customers and they have a cycle that they that they're able to utilize and so they you know start them young well we have the same thing happening here we have uh packs and organizations that are trying to keep certain people in office or take certain people out so that they can continue that cycle of being able to implement the things that they want that benefit them so i guess from there what do we do about that because you know i i think the citizens united decision was the right decision if it's uh you know People who join together in a corporation or an organization, you know, should be able to participate in the sure. political process. But I also think that they have an outsized voice, and so my concern is how do we how do we counter that? How, you know, the the PACs and the lobby groups and the big corporations they dump tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout the state in, into right. these races to yeah. do mailers and text messages and billboards supporting their candidates and opposing the ones who will actually stand up to them. So how do yeah. how do it, it feels like we're at a significant disadvantage when it comes to winning the hearts and minds of voters and convincing them to, you know, support small government, limited government, low taxes, all, all those things that we love. H how do we do that? Yeah, I think there's a few things. And I've talked to a lot of people about this. Um, 
you know, one thing is that voters have to educate themselves. They have to be educated. You know, the average time that people spend involved in the government process is about 10 minutes a year. And that's when they go in and vote and then they're done. That's it. Their hands are, are, are wiped clean. They've done their duty. That's, that's it. And then they go back to their, their lives, right? And I get it. People are busy. They have families that they're taking care of. They have jobs that they're working. So I understand that people are busy, but people have to get involved. Um, and the reason is that government was set up by, of, and for the people. And if the people aren't part of that process, it does not work correctly. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, I've had people that have, tell, have told me, you know, we really should put limits on what PACs can actually spend for or against a candidate. So just like if I take in donations, I have a limit of what I can take from an individual. Well, I, there's people that say we should be doing that with PACs too. And it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you have um, you know, some PACs that for me, I think they're great PACs. I think they do a great job because they promote limited government and they want people in office that are going to stand up, to, you know, and uphold the constitution and stand up for people's rights. But you have the flip side of the ones that don't want to, you know, the, they want the opposite of that. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword, but some people have said, hey, let's start putting limits on what PACs can donate. You know, if they're spending money for or against you, they have a limit. Um, I, some states do have that. That's that, that's what they have implemented in their state. Or you can't take any outside money at all. So there are some things. It's gonna it it. There's gonna be pros and cons to all of them, though. Well, I feel like we're you know we're we're in kind of uncharted territory politically. With um, I, I guess I'm old enough to remember the days before the internet when it was all about newspaper ads and TV ads, and now it's uh, you know text messaging and websites and. You know, Facebook ads, ads yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. yeah, no, that's true. It, 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 the whole political landscape has changed, and I think I've seen more this cycle than I have previous, as far as the uh, the schemes that are in place, or the things that are being tried, or the disinformation, or the um, just complete mudslinging, you know, that's going on. I know in my race, um. My opponent, it's just all about mudslinging and the things that are being said are not true. I mean, I'm surprised they're running a Democrat against me in the primary. I mean, I I am very shocked about that still, but that's the length that they're going to now to try to take somebody that has uh, supported or voted for Biden and try to run them as a staunch conservative. I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing the length that's going to, or text messages being sent at 2 a.m., uh, you know, by someone that didn't even actually send them. They're just utilizing names and making up pack names. And I mean, it's it's really interesting to watch the the um, the uh, the length that people are going to on on these races. Well, politics is war, and uh, you know, yes, I guess it is. sign the... wars or sign wars going on. Oh yeah, <laughs> which which you read a great article about, by the way. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I actually just had one of my signs was burnt. Burnt? <laughs> like they, they literally lit it on fire. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Uh, well, I, I, I think a lot of us are, are really, you know, especially normal voters, those who aren't even plugged into politics, they really just want to return to normalcy. And I, I think that's how you get like a Biden in the 2020 race. That, that, that was how he was sold when obviously he's just, you know double down on the you know road to totalitarianism right right. but, but people have this yeah. desire they they, they they want to just go back to normal they don't want all this fighting and such well um, look at what's happening i mean we have little control of what's happening at the federal level we really only have control of what's happening in our backyard um but our states have to regain their sovereignty we have to start standing up to the federal government and doing things that are going to help and protect our citizens People are dealing with inflation. They're dealing with um, uh, housing prices. They're dealing with, um, you know, uh, all the social issues that are going on that's affecting them, like DEI in the workplace and in their schools. And, you know, we have all these things. There's so many things coming at us from so many different angles. You know, we've got to get back to the basics. And, you know, that's, that's something that we've learned throughout history is if you just get back to the basics, things usually will set themselves straight. Um, but we have all the stuff that's transpiring at one time. So we really do need people in office that will get us back to the basics, get us back to spending within our means and, and, and wants versus needs. I mean, I love what happened with our budget this year. 
because, and that was a huge fight just in the legislature in itself, was being able to split out um, omnibus bills into bills that were wants versus needs. And so being able to do that will ultimately um, benefit the taxpayers. It will benefit our state. It will help us to be able to really get a gain and, and good oversight over what Idaho's spending and what we're taking in. Um, but we have to get back to those basics and all sorts of things. And it will, you know, if we can do that, it will set our, our, set our ship straight. Um, but uh, people need to be able to do their research and look into candidates because elections have consequences and you get the government that you deserve. And so if people want a good representative form of government, that benefits the people that are for limited government, upholding the constitution, protecting your rights, then you better make sure you have people in office that are gonna do that. Because I have seen so many times where people run one way and then they get into office and they vote the opposite. Uh, we have Republicans here in the state that vote worse than the Democrats a lot of the time uh, because they they sell themselves as conservative, they sell themselves as you know limited government, uh, that they're pro-life and pro-Second Amendment, and then they get into office and they're the ones that are drawing, you know, pro-Second Amendment bills in the drawer or, um, you know, voting against things like the anti-slap bill, which should be a no-brainer, uh, you know, just things like that. And so uh, we are, we're in a very interesting political climate, but people have got to wake up. They've got to understand that Idaho is going the same direction as California, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, uh, you know, all those other states, we're on that path. And the only way that we can stop it is to get people in office that are that are going to stand up against it. Well, ho hopefully we'll see that happen. Um, I've, I've appreciated your time. Uh, is there any yeah. other I ideas that we haven't covered or just closing thoughts? Yeah, I would just go back to make sure you do your research. Um, the May primary, it's May 21st is the primary. That is pretty much the election in Idaho. And that's something a lot of newcomers don't understand. They're used to November, right? But May is really the election here in Idaho. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of deception that's taking place within these elections. And so you really got to do your research, reach out to candidates. They don't answer your questions. That's a red flag right there. Um, but please understand that you have to do your homework, look into candidates, ask questions, and reach out to me anytime. All my stuff is, uh, you know, I'm on a lot of social media. Everything's under Nichols for Idaho. People can contact me, um, ask me questions, even my phone number, email, everything's on there. But, um, you know, if you have any questions about, and I watch a lot of the other races, so I try to stay abreast as to what's happening in, in other races too. So even if you're not from my district, feel free to reach out and ask me questions because uh, I can either tell you what I think or direct you to where it might give you the best information, so. Tammy Nichols, State Senator, District 10. Thank you. Thank you.